Feast TV is brought to you with the support from Missouri Wines, Caldi's Coffee, Old Time Produce, and the Raphael Hotel. Where there's smoke, there's got to be fire. I'm Kat Neville, and this is Feast TV. In this episode, we are going to be exploring wood-fired cooking. And when you think about wood and fire and food, the first thing that comes to your mind, I'm sure, is barbecue. So our first stop in this episode is in Kansas City at Woodyard Barbecue, where they have been supplying wood to the barbecue industry for almost 100 years. Tell me about how the wood yard came to be. In 1913, <laughs> my grandfather was in the coal and wood business. He died in 48, and my father, who was the oldest son, he got the business. And they moved a couple times, and we finally wound up over here about 60 years ago. And so when did the barbecue restaurant come about? Oh, out? about 10 years ago, when we realized that the wood business is kind of, people just aren't buying it. We couldn't afford to be here, only selling a couple hundred cords of wood. Most of our wood comes from down in southern Missouri. And as far as the kinds of wood, the big two woods around in Missouri and Kansas would be hickory and oak. And we sell a lot of that. Gates Barbecue, which is one of the biggest in town, they got six places. We've been selling them wood for 53 years. So that's kind oh, wow. of a long time. So, yeah. But uh, we got the wood, so when it snows and rains, you got a problem, you know, we got it. This is where the barbecue guys yeah, come? Yeah, that's right. This is where they come to get their wood? That's right, that's good. <laughs> so you have been supplying wood to the barbecue industry for decades Correct. and the actual barbecue restaurant kind of came along it's, later. It's, when my uncle had it back in the 50s and 60s, he'd cook on the weekends for his help and also to entice customers here to try this, you know, buy some wood and it just kind of caught on and over the years just changed and evolved. And still have the wood business. Yeah, anybody could come in wanting to buy some wood, we can come down there if they want to buy some barbecue and come back up here, you know? That's awesome. So when you are choosing something off of your menu, what are you reaching for? I like the ribs, I guess, the best. A couple Saturdays ago, we sold 176 slabs of ribs. Wow. So we're busy, you know, about three or four years ago. We had some hamburger left, we made chili, and we put some burn ends on it. And that's really good, it's really getting popular. We sell chili, you know, in the middle of the summer. But I think, you know, the ribs to me are probably the best thing. And number two would be the wings. We do about 150 wings a day. We usually run out. How did you start to really learn the art of barbecue? Because it's deceptively simple. It's meat and smoke and heat and time, but you have to really understand how all those elements, you know, come together to be able to produce great barbecue. Well, I grew up with it. Uh, my father, God rest his soul, I remember him out in the driveway back in the 60s doing it. And like people in Sweden all know how to ski. The people in Kansas City all basically know how to barbecue. It's just kind of hardwired in our DNA, so to speak. So when was this pit built? Because this thing is amazing. It's really beautiful, first off, but yeah, you don't is. see brick pits very often anymore. See, these two outer ones are lined with fire brick. They were built about 25 years ago, and there's like an inch gap for insulation, and it's really very versatile. I've got the convective, the heat drawn up. I've got conductive heat off the racks that are warming up, and uh, I've got the radiant, which is heat coming off of the fire brick itself. What time do you normally come in in the morning? Roughly 8 o'clock. So at 8 o'clock and you start these pits behind us. Correct. And what kind of wood are you using? 
A mixture of oak and pecan, occasionally a piece of hickory, apple whenever I can scrounge any up. To me, that's a perfect blend. And so how do you get the fire to exactly the temperature that you're looking for? It takes some coaxing, you know. Uh, sometimes it doesn't always want to cooperate, you know, a rainy day or in the winter. Yeah. That's when you find out what you're made of. <laughs> because the fire must go on, you know. We've got to get things up to operating temp so that we can proceed with the process of smoking all the meats. What you're shooting for is a steady, moderate temp, nice and easy. Don't overthink it and don't get in a hurry. It just has to happen on its own. In a lot of barbecue restaurants, the meat will almost be on a kind of a rotisserie, but it sounds like you're manually moving everything around Correct. and kind of like using your senses to know when and where to move everything. Oh, absolutely. You know, if I had to think about it, I probably couldn't do it. It's just a process that happens and you just kind of throw yourself in with it and it flows. So do you have a favorite? You can't be a good piece of beef, you know, and with what we're doing here, just a little bit of salt is all it needs. But we've got some of the best meat in the world here. We try to cook just enough so we're on the verge of running out continuously to keep it fresh, mm -hmm. and that's, that's the hard part. So on your ribs, obviously you have a dry rub. Right, it's a turmeric based rub. We haven't messed with the recipe, it's perfect. Rubs tend to be more paprika based, at least in the Memphis area, so having a turmeric based rub, isn't that kind of? It's pretty unique. Yeah, absolutely. Turmeric has a lot of health benefits too, they've come to find recently. Well, so barbecue's good for you. Yeah, ours is at least. <laughs> <laughs> The smoky heat of wood is being used more and more frequently in restaurant kitchens, and our next stop is in Columbia, Missouri at Flyover. Let's head over there now. So the first time I came to Flyover, it was right after they opened, and I sat down there at the end of the bar and every single dish I had was awesome. And I know that this wood-burning oven behind us has a, a really big part to play in developing flavors on your menu. Yeah, it's one of the few ways I like to cook the most. Like growing up, I was a Boy Scout, so I cooked uh, all the meals for our troop and everything. And it was mostly fire, and when I wasn't, it was a propane stove. And so I have, you know, very similar setup, so to speak, here. We have a model from Woodstone Corporation uh, they're one of the best ones in the country, like that's domestically made. Uh, they're made in Bellingham, Washington, and it has a, a gas element underneath it, but that all it does is regulate the hot spots in the stone. Oh, okay. 95% of the heat in the oven is generated by a solid fuel, or the wood, which we source from Harrisburg, actually, here in town, so. Is it oak, or what do you It's uh, white oak, red oak, and hickory. The flavor from this, obviously, is more subtle than if you were smoking. Exactly. Smoking is where you have a small, or a, a very sealed chamber that has low temperature and a lot of smoke. This is high temperature, a lot of smoke, but also the smoke's ventilated very quickly. If not, the fire goes out and you have no heat, so. And it's very toasty. I can very, feel the heat yeah. from here. We, we keep it anywhere between 675 degrees to 725 degrees. It just kind of depends on the items that are on the menu. Some react better to higher heat, some react a little better to lower heat, so we kind of just take a, an average and shoot for that. So tell me how Flyover came about. Well, I've always wanted to own my own restaurant, and so um, after I did culinary school and was, you know, did all my internships all over the country, I came back home, and uh, then my best friend moved back from doing his doctoral work in Indiana, uh, and he's one of the best bartenders I know, so we decided to do it together. And that's Dan. Like, that's Dan, yeah. Mm -hmm. He takes care of the drinks part, along with his really awesome bar staff. We didn't have the name yet, but we came up with a concept of really showcasing food and product from the Midwest. The middle of the country is very, very much ignored culinarily by the East and the West Coast, which I've worked on and I'm not knocking them at all. They're all very excellent people and chefs and restaurants out there, but they tend to just snobbishly overlook yeah. the middle of the country and call it a flyover country and that there's just nothing to do here but just fly over it. And I'm like, well, I think we can do better than that. So when we were talking about how, oh man, I remember they used to call it a flyover state here. I was like, well, that should be the name of the restaurant. And it just stuck. Ever since then, we've made the Flyover brand, and it's going pretty well, actually. So, it's going incredibly well. Every yeah. time you come here, there's a line to get in. Yeah, I can't complain about that. It's a good problem to have. 
So when you put the menu together, what was kind of the inspiration? The inspiration was actually uh, family dining, actually. Like when you go out to a restaurant or even at home, like when you're sitting around with family and friends, and then how can we take that approach, make it restaurant worthy, and then also take like the ideas of say like meatloaf or macaroni and cheese and make them things that are approachable yet different at the same time that, you, that it makes you look twice at something you see all the time. Our macaroni and cheese is macaroni and cheese, but you know, it's made with Prairie Breeze out of Iowa. It's, you know, uh, all semolina noodle. We use Patrick Farms bacon, which is local, and it's baked in the wood fire oven. We so what are you going to show us today? Um, some of the dishes we're gonna do is our uh, Midwest cassoulet. We're gonna do our spice and amaro cured duck breast. Mm. And then we're also going to do our wood fire pretzels dish. Uh, and I'm gonna be able to try that today. Yep, you sure are. This so. is why I love my job. <laughs> it's, good. it's a good job. <laughs> so. I know it is. Our uh, Midwest cassoulet. We have our black Italian kale. And then we have our homemade duck confit. We have a stew that we prepped up that is tomatoes and andouille sausage, onions, celery, carrots, fresh bay leaf, raised white beans, and some smoked pork pellet. I'm gonna use a little bit of just toasted breadcrumb and a tiny bit of Parmesan. We drizzle just a little bit of cold pressed olive oil and then this goes straight in the oven. While the castle is in there cooking, we're gonna do our soft pretzel dish. This is our best selling dish. And so we make these little cheese portions. It's a mixture of uh, borzen cheese, which is a triple cream gourmet cheese with herb and garlic and cream cheese. And then we just pop it right next to the fire. It's Command & Bakery's pretzel sticks. While the cheese is cooking, we warm the pretzels up next to it. So then we have our cooked borzen. It's nice and bubbly around the edges, got a nice brown on top. We take some local honey that's infused with thyme. We have our dried cranberries here, and then we have some toasted walnut pieces. We just do some simple fresh chopped parsley on top because it tastes nice. And that's our pretzels dish. And then our cassoulet should be ready. We drizzle just a little bit more of this cold pressed olive oil on top. A little blend of microgreens of popcorn shoots, daikon sprouts, and a little bit of cabbage sprout, a little bit of fresh parsley. And that's our cassoulet. We'll do the duck breast next. So we take Maple Leaf Farm duck breast, and we make a spice rub of sumac, uh, pepper, garlic, orange zest, and uh, Maro Montenegro. We cure it for a couple days, and it goes skin side down, and it gets tucked by the fire and the duck breast will be about good medium, medium rare when it's all said and done, and it takes less than 10 minutes. We get some diced up zucchini and yellow squash. We'll add the kale and the couscous. And that's the side for the duck. And the duck breast is out and resting now, which is good. And then uh, on top of it, we have a sesame lime vinaigrette that we make. We have some pretty sunflower sprouts. And that is our duck dish. That's the spice and amaro cured duck, sesame lime vinaigrette, and squash and kale studded Israeli couscous. Those are our three plates. Believe it or not, some wood-fired ovens are mobile, and the Balkan Treat Box is bringing authentic Turkish and Bosnian food to the streets of St. Louis. So we're standing here on the streets of downtown St. Louis, right next to City Garden. And this kind of is a stretch of the city where a lot of food trucks kind of gather every day for lunch. Absolutely, with the businesses around town and downtown, it lends itself really well to the lunch crowd. So give me a snapshot of kind of your history and what led you to open the Balkan Tree Box. I kind of always knew that I wanted to do this kind of cuisine, this, this style, mostly because it, it spoke to me in ways of being able to bake, mm -hmm. but then also still being able to do the savory stuff too, because I like to do that. So when I went out on my own, I did all this traveling and research, and I went over to Turkey and Bosnia and Croatia and every place that I could go and learn to cook. So I would go into bakeries, and I would also go into people's homes. I would go to the grocery store and be like, I'm gonna buy your groceries today. Let me come home with you. And Seriously? Like 90% of people were like, okay. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Home. And then these women didn't speak any English, and I didn't speak 
hardly any of their language. But they showed you their techniques. Everything. Well, and so for, for those of us who have maybe never been to that part of the world, what is the food like? It's very comforting. Every household is making their bread. Every household has a vegetable garden, fruit trees, uh, everything is resourced right around them. And that speaks to me, you know, like that's how I grew up. I watch food that way. I watch people cook that way. So the wood had to be part of what you were launching because it really is kind of an elemental part of cooking from that part of the world. And it's one of the ingredients that adds to the flavor of the dishes. Absolutely. Yeah. You drive through these different cities and counties of the of that country or those countries and they're cooking just right over wood and you get this like crunch and the softness and all of these things happen together when you cook with wood. It just makes it so much more complex. It does. One of the things with the wood burning oven is that we wanted to make sure that you could see it. So when you walk up and you're ordering, it's right there to the left, the flames are bursting, <laughs> like it's just going and people are already like, wow, you know, this is amazing. Like what is going on in here? And of course the question is, it gets so hot, but it's not any hotter than a normal hot kitchen. No, that's not true. It's like 120 degrees in there right now, Lauren. It's definitely hot. It's definitely hot. Yes. No, it is. And it's just, I guess if you just get used to it. And when you love something, it doesn't get to you so much. Not only does Lauren have the wood burning oven on the truck, but you also have a grill and then you have the spit that the donor spins on and that has flames as well. So you have three different ways of cooking with fire. With fire. <laughs> I like fire. <laughs> when you were coming up with the menu, mm -hmm. um, it had to be small because you're cooking in a tiny truck. So how did you determine what you wanted to make? Because each one of the dishes that you're offering, they all have that bread as the base, but they could not be more different. Right, so when I was creating the menu, we knew exactly what we loved about the cuisine. For the treat box, we went to all the favorites. The donor, you live in Turkey, yep. so the first thing you get is donor. Yep. I mean, you walk through the town and you smell it. And then for the chivapi, it's a treat. And the chivapi are those small Bosnian sausages. Yes. And then the pide, you make only a limited amount every day. Yeah, so we always do a seasoned beef and cheese, and then an also just cheese for people that don't eat meat. So it's kind of like all the all-stars from the Balkan region, in my opinion. So now we're here on the truck, and I mean, this is a pretty compact area. It is, it's a compact area, and doing this kind of a menu on a truck is, I guess ambitious. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna don my apron and Lauren, you're gonna teach me how to roll up some of these really gorgeous pita. I am. So what do I do? So I take your rolling pin. Uh -huh. And at this point, you're just gonna flatten out your dough. There you go. This is a really beautiful dough. Thank you. We're gonna stuff the pide now. The pide all get stuffed with whatever you're putting in them. For us today, it's a seasoned ground beef and a Turkish style cheese. Once we fold that crust over, that first bite, you're gonna get the filling. This is gonna be amazing. <laughs> I love that you already think that. <laughs> I cannot wait to eat this. I do get to eat one, right? Of course. Doing a great job. Thanks, Lauren. I need that positive reinforcement. I made that. She made that. All right. <laughs> All right, cool. Perfect. I'm gonna get out of your way. All right. I'm gonna let her get to work. It smells amazing in here. You can smell this like sweet yeast and like just the, the kind of wonderful smell of the smoke. It's, it's almost like it is intoxicating. It is. That's exactly what it is. All right, here comes yours, cat. <laughs> Look at that. That is perfect. You've really captured that flavor of that part of the world. Thank you. And I've never tasted anything else like this in St. Louis. So even if you don't live in St. Louis, 
get here and eat this. It's amazing. So when I tried the food for the first time at Balkan Treat Box, it really brought me back to my childhood because when I was a kid, my dad was in the Air Force and we lived in Turkey for a few years. And the food that they're making at Balkan Treat Box is extremely authentic and reminiscent of real Turkish food. So I thought that what I would demonstrate for you today is Turkish kofta which essentially are these wonderful, spicy little meatballs that are grilled and then served with bob ganoush and a yogurt sauce. It's wonderful and it's easy and quick. I have a pound of ground beef here in my bowl. My first addition to the bowl is grated onion. You find grated onion used a lot in Indian cooking and also Mediterranean cooking. It really brings out the flavor and the aroma and just the pungency of that onion. I need just about a half cup, so that should do it right in the bowl. Now I'm gonna add in about half a cup of fresh breadcrumbs. Very easy to make. You just take some bread, dry it out in the oven, and then pulse it in your food processor. So there we go. Now I'm also going to add in about half a cup of parsley, two minced garlic cloves. One trick if you want your garlic to break down and become a little bit more kind of pulpy in a way is to add salt when you're chopping it. The extra friction from the salt and also just the salt itself will start pulling all the juices out of that garlic. Next up, we're going to add two teaspoons of chopped fresh oregano. Love fresh herbs. If you don't have fresh oregano, obviously you can use dried, but the pungency of the fresh is really gonna add so much flavor and aroma. And now, the spices. So this is sumac, and it's a beautiful kind of rusty color. It has almost a lemony, citrusy flavor to it. You find this in a lot of Middle Eastern restaurants. If you're looking for the entire recipe, all of the amounts, just go to feastmagazine.com and in the Feast TV section, all the recipes are there. A Little bit of cumin and this is hot paprika. It's gonna have a nice amount of heat. I'm gonna put in a little bit more salt and some pepper as well. And I'm going to mix together some water, lemon juice, and baking soda. And I'm gonna add that to this mixture. And then I'm going to knead this mixture for about 10 minutes to get it thoroughly combined. So my kofta mixture is resting behind me and now I'm gonna make the baba ganoush and my yogurt sauce. Now, baba ganoush, magic of television, I already roasted this eggplant over my grill yesterday. And all you need to do to roast an eggplant is take the whole eggplant, poke some holes in it, and then put it on the grill, or you can also inside put it over your, uh, your gas burner on your stove if you have one. And you wanna cook it for about half an hour until it is absolutely falling apart and collapsing as you can see here. Then you take the eggplant and you put it either in a plastic container or a paper bag to let it steam. And what you'll end up with is this. All of the flesh kind of falls away from the skin and it's gonna have this beautiful smoky character to it. Make sure you scrape off any of the flesh that is still kind of clinging to that skin. I'm just mashing my eggplant up just so it is broken up a little bit before I add in the rest of my ingredients. All right, I'm gonna put in just a couple of garlic cloves. You want your garlic to be something of a paste because you don't wanna end up with chunks of garlic in the baba ganoush. You want it to very smoothly and evenly spread throughout the dip. Next up, in goes half a cup of tahini. 
This is where the magic happens with baba ganoush. Aside from the smoky, beautiful, kind of almost sweet flavor of the eggplant, tahini adds so much flavor. Tahini is kind of like peanut butter made out of sesame seeds. It, all it is is ground up sesame seeds. That's it. But the flavor is incredibly complex and it is the key to a good baba ganoush. So now I'm gonna add in a little bit of cumin and some more of that hot paprika. And then I'm adding in the juice of one lemon. And add in some salt and a good hit of pepper. All right, now I'm just gonna make a very quick yogurt sauce. This is whole milk yogurt. If you really want to, you can use the lower fat yogurts, but you're not gonna get the same kind of flavor. So I recommend that you use the whole milk. And again, just gonna put in some lemon juice, salt and pepper, and a garlic clove. Last bit, I'm gonna go ahead and make little meatballs and thread them onto skewers. I have my meatballs on their skewers. I've already preheated my grill pan. It's on medium high. So my coft is finished and it is fragrant and gorgeous. And I'm going to be serving this with some fresh pita bread, some sliced red onion, and then I have my baba ganoush and my yogurt sauce. Both of these I've topped with a good dose of olive oil. And I am pairing my Turkish delight with a rosé from Casey Wineworks. They make really lovely urban wines. This particular rosé is made from the Chamberson grape, which is one of our native hybrid grapes here in Missouri. The rosé is gonna go really nicely with all of the spices and the lemon and all that garlic. So the next time you're looking for something interesting to grill, try something Turkish. Cheers, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>